Good evening. Um, it is so gratifying to see you all here. Uh, my name is Dan Chartrand. I'm the owner of Water Street Bookstore. And uh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Can I have you here every time? That's the cue. You know what that means. <laughs> check, check those uh, mobile devices. Thank you, Haz. Um, so it's just so gratifying to see you all here tonight um, for such a great book. It's a beautiful evening. We don't take it for granted when people come into the store and attend these events. Um, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you all for being here. I'm very appreciative. Uh, as I was uh, prepping for this introduction last night, I was having a flashback. And part of the reason I was having a flashback was, you know, this, the book is set in Boston and Cambridge, and I spent kind of the same 10 years of my life in Boston and Cambridge, uh, my 20s and early 30s, as, you know, as, you know, sort of the, the time when Nina was working as a journalist. And I just, I was having a real flashback. There's, so, and, and then I thought about, well, I was working in an office in the 80s and early 90s, and I decided I needed to get out of that office and do this, be here, doing more physical work, but also more interacting with community face to face. And I think, as I was flipping through your book and reading passages, that really caught me was that you went from something where you were in an office and maybe kind of locked into a screen to going out into the world and, and working with, and I love how they put this on the jacket copy, um, she's not only working with her unflappable mentor, Mary, a petite but tough carpenter sage, as, but as well, wild demo dudes, fall mouth pl plumbers, grizzled hard hardware store clerks, and the f colorful clients whose homes she's in. It reminded me a lot of the idea of what I had in mind for this uh, bookstore when I opened it. I wanted all those folks in here. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations, you found your community. That's true, that's true. <laughs> and it's so nice to welcome you to our community here at the bookstore, Nina. Oh, yeah. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Please join me in welcoming Nina. Thanks. Thank you um, very much. It's great. It's great to be here. My mom actually grew up in Exeter, um, although I have spent no time here. Um, uh, so it's neat to be sort of, I don't know, in this town, which I have some connection to, but don't know well. Um, so for the past few weeks, I, um, I've been sort of doing book-related stuff, and um, just this past week, returned to the carpentry. Um, feeling um, kind of soft, muscled, and um, rusty. Um, and so we were framing a, a wall, pretty basic, actually like the, really the most sort of basic stuff you can do. Um, and you know, I was chopping boards and you know, shooting the, the framing gun and uh, get to the end of the wall and realize that the first piece that I had put up the top, the top plate, which everything sort of hinges on, um, was off by two and a half inches and was just like, oh no, and sat there swearing for about five minutes. Um, and my boss Mary came over with the cat's paw, which is sort of the, a very kind of um, simple and efficient tool for kind of pulling out these giant nails. I was just like, oh my God, this sucks. Um, and pulled out a few and sort of, it had a little give. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, great. I, you know, can, Mary, can I try with a sledgehammer to see if it moves a little? And she said, go ahead, try with a sledgehammer, you know? So I, I, I took the sledgehammer and, and it went two taps and it was exactly where it should be. So that was, it was a triumph. And it also made me realize, sort of like, you know, I've, I've been talking a lot and um, sort of had those sort of cringy moments of saying like, oh God, I said the dumbest thing. And also with the book, like there isn't that kind of like, oh, let me go back and take the sledgehammer to it and kind of make it right. Um, all of this is kind of now set in stone. All the things that I'm sort of saying can't be kind of unsaid. So it's, it was, it's been a relief to be back to the carpentry work um, in combination with this stuff. Um, quick background. Um, I used to work as a journalist six years ago. I got a job as a carpenter with really, um, really no experience. I worked at a place called the Boston Phoenix, which was an alternative news weekly and a great place to work. Um, uh, it was the first job I had out of college um, and it was just, it was a, just a bunch of brainy, curious, funny weirdos that I got to go to work with every day. Um, really incredible. Um, as my job evolved, I became the one of the web editors and so it was, it required just sort of sitting at a screen and clicking and scrolling and um, it just like, you know, 
dulled my brain to the max and um, it took about a year to kind of summon up the courage um, to leave and, and uh, finally I did. Um, and sort of this is the story of that, um, that, that transition and sort of learning this new, this new thing. Um, so I'm going to read a couple um, short little sections. Um, and this is sort of from the beginning where um, uh, I had sort of responded to an ad on Craigslist saying carpenter's assistant, women strongly encouraged to apply. Um, <clears throat> all right. Four days after applying for the carpentry job, Four days after sweeping the thought of it out of my head, I got an email back from an anonymous Craigslist generated number. It was a woman named Mary writing to say that she was contacting 40 of us who'd applied for the job out of more than 300 responses she'd gotten in the first 18 hours of posting her ad. Sign of the time, she wrote. This was back in 2008 when the economy was in the, in the toilet. This was hopeful. I'd made the short list. I let that settle for a moment before I realized that 40 people was still a lot of people and I still only had enthusiasm and a work ethic as quasi-qualifications. <coughs> I kept reading. She explained a bit more about herself, about the job, and what she was looking for, straightforward as a two-by-four to the side of the head. <laughs> I'm a 43-year-old married lesbian with a 10-year-old daughter, she wrote. She'd worked for herself for a few years and before that had worked for another contractor. I like to think of myself as a journeyman level carpenter and a slightly better Tyler. I didn't know what this meant, but I liked the sound of journeyman. It brought to mind a wandering carpenter, tools slung over her shoulder, traveling place to place, building and fixing, humming away in worn in work pants, a smile on her face. It got better. She described the traits she was looking for. Common sense is the most important thing. Next is lugging crap. You must be able to. I, yeah. I gripped my left bicep and felt the muscles swell as I flexed. I can lug crap, I thought. I can absolutely lug crap. I thought of moving boxes, uh, sorry, I thought of moving couches and tables out of various apartments, hauling boxes and boxes of books up and down flights of stairs, tools, supplies, whatever, she wrote, of what we lug. And common sense, sure, my judgment was sound enough. I'm not the most practical-minded, but I'm a good parallel parker. I can follow a recipe. Sometimes I know what I'm going to wear the day before I wear it. Skills used will vary from job to job, she explained, and jobs range from a day to several months, usually averaging about two weeks. And then came a list of the sorts of work that the jobs entailed in a language mostly unfamiliar. Go in, patch walls, and paint. Clear enough, I could paint, but who knew what patching meant? Put in a wood or tile floor, add trim, sounded doable. Larger jobs, kitchen and bathroom renovations, structural work. This sounded serious and intimidating. Demo, framing, insulating, fire stopping, boarding, mudding, installing windows, finished trim work, install cabs, porch rebuilds, pretty much everything except additions and roofs. What did these words mean? Demo? I thought first of demonstrations, framing. Framing pictures, I imagined, and that'd be cool to learn. <laughs> boarding. I pictured boarding houses and torture techniques and figured it was neither. <laughs> Mudding. Mudding? All of it sounded mysterious and appealing. She asked that we explain a little bit more about ourselves and why we wanted the job. In my response, I tried to be as direct and honest as she'd been. I'm 30 years old, I wrote. I spent the past bunch of years working at a newspaper. In terms of carpentry, I'll be honest, I don't have much experience. That said, I'm strong. Lugging crap is no problem at all. I claimed a good, sensible head on my shoulders and emphasized again how curious I was to learn this stuff. I wrote about the satisfaction of putting together a good sentence, but that something more immediate, more physical, more practical and tangible appealed to me and had for some time. This is work I want to learn and do, I wrote. You would have to teach me, but I would learn fast and don't mind do doing hard work. I can start immediately. And so throughout the last, these last half a dozen years that I've been doing the carpentry work, I've also been writing the whole time as well. Um, uh, for the first three years that I was doing it, sort of mostly freelance stuff, um, continuing to write about books and doing features and stuff for various magazines and newspapers. Um, and then sort of three years into it, starting this project. Um, and so it's, I found over this time, this sort of, they, the two pursuits complement each other really in, in an amazing way. Um, you know, I find that um, after being on the job uh, for some time, I'll start getting that itch to be writing and vice versa. After I've been sitting at my computer typing away, like, 
It's just like, get me back to the deck we're building, um, which I feel lucky to have sort of both in combination. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, the, the analogies come easily between carpentry and writing, sort of hammering out a sentence and stuff. Um, but what appeals to me, um, I think, is also how different they are. And this short section is a little bit about the sort of, the similarities and differences between the two. The novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez once told the Paris Review that ultimately literature is nothing but carpentry. Both are very hard work. With both you are working with reality, a material just as hard as wood. It's true that writing and carpentry both require patience and practice, and both revolve around the effort of making something right and good. Both involve getting it wrong over and over and being able to stay with it until it is right. In both, the best way of understanding something is often by taking it apart. In both, small individual pieces combine and connect to make something larger, total, whole. In both, we start with nothing and end with something. But what appealed to me so much about carpentry work is how far it is from words. The zone in my brain that gets activated building bookshelves is a different one than the one that puts together sentences. And what a relief that can be, not having to worry about the right word not having to think over and over, is this the best way to say this? The question carpentry raises are the same ultimately. Will this work? Will this function as it should be true and strong? But the answers come from, a different, from different rooms in my head and it is good to exit the word room in favor of a less used realm that deals with space, numbers, tools, and materials. Much of what carpentry requires does not come naturally to me. Angles, numbers, basic logic, but with carpentry, you have a tape measure, a saw, a pencil, a piece of wood, concrete, understandable, real in the world, each of these things made for a specific purpose. Marquez admits a few sentences later that he'd never done any carpentry himself. If he had, he'd know that a piece of wood is not the same as words. A wall is real. A piece of baseboard that hides the gap between the wall and the floor, that's real too. There's a sense of completion with carpentry that doesn't exist with writing. Words are ghosty and mutable. A measurement, a cut, sawdust in my lungs, and the piece of wood slides in to fit tight with a few taps of the hammer. It's the opposite of abstract. Measure, measure, mark, cut, nail in. Um, and uh, so after I uh, applied for this job and exchanged a few emails with this woman named Mary, um, I, um, uh, she explained the interview process. She sort of had I think six of us come in to spend half a day of work with her, um, one at a time. Um, and so my sort of audition day was um, tiling a, a floor in this um, beautiful, beautiful house in Cambridge. Um, uh, and again, not having any experience, we were sort of, you know, arrived on the, on the site and Mary was sort of setting up the saw and, you know, kind of setting up for the day. And she said, all right, you, you cut, I'll lay. And I was just like, what? Um, so it was, you know, I, I, I was like, well, I, yeah, I've never, I've never used a tile saw before. Um, and, and she being kind of the calmest, um, most relaxed human alive, uh, sort of just said, don't worry about it, just go slow. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of what I tried to do. Um, this is, um, this last quick section that I'll read is um, from the sort of the tail end of that audition day. Um, and uh, Mary has gone out for a smoke. I looked at the section of floor we'd completed so far. Rain hit the window and pattered on the roof above. Footsteps on the stairs and an old man appeared. He looked a hundred years old, with a long white beard and long white hair tied back in a ponytail that hung between his shoulder blades, like the tail of something that belonged in snows. He wore light, hammer-looped, paint-splattered pants and a white t-shirt that hung from his shoulders like a sheet. He carried a paint can and a brush, a dull canvas drop cloth under his arm. He set himself up on the opposite side of the room by one of the dormer windows. Good to see women on the job, he said. I didn't know what to say. It would be clumsy to explain that I wasn't really on the job, just trying out, had only been on the job for a couple hours, that I didn't know how to read a tape measure. It would be clumsy to say it was good to see a hundred-year-old wizard on the job, too. <laughs> Thanks, I said. It's good to be on the job. When Mary returned from her smoke, we kept working without much talk and finished laying the tile. They needed a night to set before they could be grouted, so we were done for the day. The combination of concentration, newness, of not knowing the rhythm of the day made the minutes swift. Three to four on a Tuesday afternoon at your desk when all you're doing is murdering the minutes, 
It feels like torture because in the back of our brains, what we know is these hours are our only ones. They are finite and will be finished. A girl I knew once went around to all the guests at a party and told them one by one, this is your real life, you know. This is your real life. <laughs> what a thing to be reminded of and how easy to forget. I liked how the tiles looked on that floor. We packed up the tools, reloaded the van, and I shivered a bit on the ride back. I wondered if I'd botched too many tiles, if my lugging had impressed, if she'd noticed the time I'd gotten out of her light. You freezing, Mary asked, a little chilled. She blasted the heat and the windshield wiper swept, swept across the glass. When we got back to her driveway, I thanked her and she laughed. Thank you, she said, and handed me 70 bucks in cash. <coughs> that was 10 bucks an hour and it seemed like a lot of money for what I'd done. Go take a hot shower, she said. Get that tile dust out of your hair. I rubbed my palm across my head, damp and gritty. Crumbs of tile dust had adhered to my hair. I thanked her again. Take care, she said. These were final parting words. Words you say to someone you don't know and won't see again. I headed home cold and low, a fatigue in my bones from standing all day, and a recognition in those two words that she would hire someone else. Take care. I went to bed early and all the bad thoughts returned as the wind picked up and the rain lashed. Regret, work, money, <coughs> health insurance, loneliness, missed trains, and empty calendars. The next morning, gray but no rain, Mary called. She told me the job was mine if I wanted it. I told her that I did. <laughs> and I'm, you know, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, or we can, I, I can say more about embarrassing moments of, at, the, at the job, which is many. Um, yeah. Let's more embarrassing moments. More, oh gosh, more, okay. All right, more embarrassing moments. All right, so um, this summer, um, we were building this beautiful deck. It's by far, it was my, it's been my favorite project that we've done. 800 square foot, made out of black locust, um, designed by this architect, kind of, yeah, giant. Um, it was for a mass Audubon property, um, so sort of uh, this sort of state park type sanctuary, right, nature sanctuary. Um, and it was just, you know, working in this beautiful environment outside, the weather was great, everything was great. Um, and um, it, because it was so huge and we were sort of on a, on a deadline, it required a lot of screws to be put in to get every board down. And so the Math <coughs> Audubon uh, folks asked a couple volunteers to come in some, you know, to help us put screws in. Um, and uh, so, you know, we show up to work and it was like three or four men, probably, I don't know, in their 60s. And I think they were a little kind of surprised to see two, two women. Um, and, you know, I think being a little baffled, uh, they, they screwed up a lot. They were, they were sort of, they were, you know, missing the joist and stripping screws. And, you know, it was sort of a lot of mistakes were being made. And I was just kind of like, it was, you know, I'd been working for weeks. I was very on and like feeling very confident. And, um, and so at the end of the day, um, there was one section we hadn't, we hadn't sort of finished and an eight foot drop below um, to the ground. Um, and I was talking and gesticulating and took a step backwards right into the place we hadn't put in parts. And my boss, Mary, took this kind of flying leap towards me, which was sort of half shove, half catching, and kind of pushed me so that I didn't fall into the hole. Um, and so stood up, kind of like made sure I was, you know, everything was in one piece. And I could tell that the guys were concerned. They were also, I think, a little bit relieved. Like I had just undone any bit of cred that I'd sort of earned all day. Um, uh, and it was one of those things that like, I would just sort of like, yeah, for the next couple of weeks would just cringe, you know, falling asleep and just be like, oh God, I can't believe it. Um, so that's, I mean, that stands out as a very kind of embarrassing crucially embarrassing uh, moment. Um, yeah, but otherwise a fantastic project. Um, how, how did you manage to cut tile mm -hmm. on the first day? What did she show you how to do after for never having done something like that? Well, you know, she, um, what she did first was um, she, she, marked, she marked a pencil line and just mm -hmm. said, cut on the line. You know, uh, what I learned <laughs> very quickly is that tile saws are wet saws, so the mm -hmm. blade spins through water, and hers is quite beat up, um, and the little sort of catch that 
should catch the spray was, you know, at an angle like this. So I was getting <laughs> blasted with <laughs> crumbs of tile and, like, you know, spray. Um, and it was just, like, you know, just trying to concentrate on staying on that line. Um, uh, and, you know, some were more successful than others. Uh, but it, with that, that I, I'll never forget, because I still, you know, we still sort of experience it, but that, that sort of total focus um, of blade, blade on line um, uh, was unforgettable. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, her instructions were were minimal. <laughs> stay on the line. Yeah, <laughs> go slow and stay on the line. Yeah, exactly. Yep. How about any aha moments when you finally got something that you never thought you'd understand? Oh my gosh, I mean, so many. You know, the the learning curve was was so steep. Um, I think probably the most amazing thing was um, learning um, learning. I mean, this is so basic and embarrassing, but learning how walls are built. You know, that's like this thing that, I don't know, I had surely taken for granted, just like <laughs> everything around us, how space is divided. Um, I felt like, you know, I had x-ray eyes and sort of could see this whole new world was sort of opening up to me. So that walls, I think, were our first kind of like, oh my gosh, like this is, this is it. It's so simple. Um, and I think, I think before I started the work, it all, it, it kind of seemed like, this like mystical <coughs> knowledge realm that I would have no ability to understand. Like almost like, I mean like being a doctor almost, you know, it's just like this, these, are, these are some sort of magicians that have this kind of sacred knowledge sphere that, that is beyond what I'll ever know. Um, and it's not that, you know, I mean it's, it isn't that. Um, and so I think sort of that process of demystification um, has, I mean, as, you know, it's still, I mean it's still kind of like, these walls, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, you guys do a little building. How have you found being women up here, around here? Because this is what people have been asking, and you can tell me if I'm putting you, putting you on the spot. Because um, people have been asking me a lot, like, oh, what is it like being a woman on the job? Um, I found it, um, I think people assume that it's quite hostile and it's sort of raunchy and guys are, you know, condescending and jerks. It hasn't, I haven't found that at all. Um, the people that we work with are nothing but respectful, joking, laughing, friends. Um, I mean, there have been a few moments of, you know, jerks, but you find jerks anywhere. Um, so I wonder what, if you guys, how you have found it. <coughs> you get to pick your sights. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it. Exactly, yeah. Definitely. It's, it's been, it's been a lot of, Plumbers. 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 That's, that's so accurate. Yeah. <laughs> they are just the rashiest guys. I've never seen a plumber guy at jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you doing here? Uh-huh, so uh-huh. You, you kind of go from, and then especially doing it as long as I have, I feel like I've kind of moved from the girl on the job mm. to job mom. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. But now, I'm, you know, if you have a baby, yeah, stop you can cook. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it's just brownies. The power of a brownie. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Big brownies the first day, they're yours. Yep. For the yep. rest of the job. Gosh, all right, good. Good. I'll, yeah. That's good advice. <laughs> good advice. Suddenly, the little truck that has to be unloaded and be like, oh, yeah. Did you hear? That's good. Yeah. That's great. You can have play both ways. Yeah. But that's what's nice about me. Yeah. I mean, we get to play both ways. <laughs> The comment about plumbers is dead on. Yeah, dead it's true. On. Some electricians too, but especially plumbers. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll just like, they only want to go, you're a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> huh. Um, anyone else do any building of their own? A little kind of stuff you play with, not serious building. That one's a in the basement. That's serious. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely serious. I, mine's upstairs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I like your, your connection between doing, you know, whether it's stuff on the computer or whatever it else it is, if you can then move to something that's physical, mm. working with wood or Digging holes in the garden, whatever. It yes. Is. If you can transfer to something that uses a totally different part of your brain, it's 
like somebody opened the windows and let the air in. It's just totally, you know, it, you, you get to a point where you say, you know what, I have to put this garbage of my life down. Yep. I did some political stuff. I'm going to put that away because mm -hmm. that's clearly getting me nowhere. And I think I will go, you know, sand some wood. Or, yep. Or, yep. You know, rip out some things in the garden or do something. But there is just a nice balance. It happens when you have that option. It's. I mean, even the blizzard. I, I have to tell you, shoveling. it likes snow, but yeah. going out and shoveling was like, oh, I don't know. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, you know, it was really kind of a nice release. Yep. Absolutely. I guess that's what it is. It's a nice release. Yeah. And it's funny, you know. I. I. For me, I know. I find that after a day of writing, um, you know, I'll kind of like come out of whatever hole I've been in and just am kind of like pinched and and kind of like distracted and sour sour of mood and coming back after a day of deck building or whatever it's just like up and optimistic and tired and hungry but like really sort of much more open um, and it does feel like I don't know sort of doing being able to step away and sort of put your brain into your hands I think can kind of benefit whatever else you're going to be doing, sort of exactly what you're saying, can kind of allow some space for this sort of, the word work to take place even when you're not kind of grinding away right, at it right. in the moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, shoveling is a great, a great example. Mm -hmm. Anything where it's just like, I mean, yeah, that kind of physical <coughs> mindlessness um, or the sort of much more focused kind of detail-oriented yeah. stuff. Um, yes? Do you, do your good friends or your family get it? And if they do, how did you help them get it? Or, or how do you go about addressing that? Good question. You know, I mean, I, um, so both my parents, my, my dad, um, carves decoys and has, um, all, all my life. And, and, and so our basement, we also had a bandsaw and many other saws and many, many, many different types of hand tools. And I didn't give a crap about it. You know, like I just was like, oh, those are, those are these things downstairs. I don't care. Um, like he would go down there with a block of wood and some days later it would be a duck, you know, it's just like, all right, who cares? And my mom, um, my mom is a knitter and knits all the time. Um, beautiful, beautiful sweaters and blankets, whatever. Um, and I think that being sort of, I was, so I was raised by people who use their hands and I think I was totally unaware of it at the time, but I think it did kind of soak in, soak into me. Um, so, in terms of people's reactions, my mom got it, I think, immediately. I think my dad was a little bit more skeptical. Um, I think that he um, found it a little difficult to explain it to his friends, and I think would have preferred me to go off and get a, you know, a, a master's. How friends at the Phoenix? Oh, my, my pals at the Phoenix, yeah. I think, you know, again, for the most part, supportive and excited. Certainly, some people kind of, you know, like, oh, how charming, you know, this yeah, sort of like, right. you know, like, a good lark. for you. A lark, exactly. And, and I was really, really sensitive to that because, it, I mean, at first, you know, I was just like, what am I doing? What, what, who, who am I now, you know? And it, and it, I don't know, I don't know what the definition of a lark is, but it's been six years now. I feel like that's gone beyond lark, larkdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I was, I was really, I was really, I myself was sensitive to that idea of, I don't know, I mean, in part because, I don't know, some years ago, particularly around that time, there were books coming out about sort of people stepping away from their normal lives and doing, you know, it's like, oh, my year without shoes, you know, or whatever it was. And like, I was, you know, I was, I definitely didn't want to kind of fall into that kind of gimmicky, uh, I don't know, project. Um, um, and so it was, I think, while I was still unsure of it all, um, certainly felt people's unsureness reflected back at me, you know, because I think people say, oh, what are you doing now? And I'd sort of say, well, I used to be a journalist and I did all this stuff and now, and now I'm working as a carpenter, you know, like, uh, question mark, who knows? Um, and so it's taken, it did take, I mean, it's taken some years to sort of be able to have the confidence to say, like, this is what I'm up to, you know. Um, and I'll say, too, like, you know, I've been writing professionally almost, you know, I mean, since graduating from college and have now this book and um, still feel like I have to, um, uh, 
convince myself to like have the courage to say like I'm a writer, you know, and it's and it's the same with carpentry. Um, like, I don't know yet. What like what at what point do you kind of earn it? You know, what point are you allowed to say like I'm a carpenter? You know, and I feel it exactly the same with both. You don't know this, this sort of like, oh, am I allowed to say this? I don't know. Um, and it certainly requires on both counts, uh, kind of just like, yeah, just like yeah, courage. Um, but most people, most people have been cool. Definitely some like, mm, <laughs> good for you, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what are your favorite and least favorite things to do? Sure. Um, favorite and least favorite. Um, least favorite is definitely demo. I hate the demo work. Um, I I really get stressed out about the stuff that we're breathing in. We're working in a lot of old homes around Boston, and it's just, I don't know, I just, I really fret. My, my boss, Mary, is much more cavalier and sort of, you know, never wears a mask and um, is, is sort of totally unafraid. Um, uh, but I, yeah, that, I, I hate that. It, like, keeps me awake at night. I'll sort of close my eyes and, like, just see dust particles uh, floating <laughs> around. Um, favorite thing to do... Um, I don't know, in part tiling, I do love tiling, I think in part because it was the first thing that I did. Um, uh, you know, hour for hour building bookshelves is not particularly interesting, but I, I also love doing the bookshelves, um, I guess maybe for, for sort of obvious reasons. Um, I um, was saying earlier, um, I've been sort of teaching myself how to make tables, and I, I feel like I always sound a little bit um, kind of fruity and ridiculous, but I think I don't know, I sort of realized in, in making these kind of big sort of dining room tables, um, you know, there's something sacred about, about gathering around a table, and so the building of these things has, has had a different sort of power um, than, you know, kind of um, building a closet. Um, so... <laughs> um, that would be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> closet would be yeah. the um, uh, so that's, and you know, honestly, like, I still think it's neat building walls. I mean, that's, it's still, that's still cool too. But so yeah, bookshelves and tables, um, that, that's sort of been the things that I find most kind of powerful and satisfying. Yeah. Do, do you find yourself looking at different woods and materials like that in, in a different way than you ever Definitely. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly no expert, you know, if you were to hold up two pieces of wood, I would not, I would prob probably not be able to sort of identify, you know, which was which. Um, um, but it, it has absolutely sort of changed the way I walk into any room, you know, noticing the trim work, mm -hmm. noticing um, the thresholds, the floorboards, I mean, um, the walls, all the seams, um, the paint jobs even. Um, so I'm much more attuned to the physical space around me um, <coughs> way more and I think that was I don't know I think a lot of it was was this kind of ha realization of how much I sort of took for granted you know you sort of go around your life and just like these things just exist and thinking now like all sort of being able to go through the steps of how they came to exist the way they are um, and whether the people did a good job or not yeah, um, yeah. on that steep learning curve is there something that you haven't done that you could imagine really being intimidated to be asked by Mary to, to try? You know, we haven't done a ton of crown molding. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and so if she were to sort of just say, have at it, uh, I, that would be, it would, it would take me a very long time and I would be, I would, yes. That I think that, and I would, I would love it because the times we have, like I do, like the slowness of it and the sort of precision, um, coping out the sort of for the joints and stuff. I, I love, but we haven't done enough of it for it to for to feel practiced um, or, I mean, even competent for me. Um, so that would be that would be, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's when I say like the, the, my brain is so slow at that stuff, you know. Kind of, I mean, just like having to sit there and be like, no, is that is that like, drawing a million pictures and stuff? Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, it's uh, again, it's lucky. I mean, it's 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 the sort of distinction between 
you could you could use thousands of words to explain how to do crown molding, you know, and it's not going to actually help you. You just have to do it again and again and again and again. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Do you think um, you'll be doing this now, or something like this, for a really long time? Yeah. You know. I mean, it's I. Something you need now. Yeah. I, it's certainly that's the word. Yeah. Like it certainly does feel like something I need. You know, um, I was working with Mary today, um, and we have a very full season ahead of us. Um, uh, and you know, I know that like you know whether I'm getting paid to go into people's homes to do this kind of renovation stuff or doing stuff for myself um, and sort of kind of uh, shifting more towards the I don't know at least more of these tables and stuff and learning more about that. It's stuff I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life yeah, for sure. Cool. Aren't you glad that you? did that took that yeah and turn. you know yeah. it was yeah it and it was um i mean it was terrifying you know because i i left my job not knowing what i was going to do and it was 2008 you know there were no there were no jobs and um so there was a lot of like i mean really just fear i was really scared um and it was six months or so maybe a little bit longer before i saw this kind of miracle ad on craigslist um and even after starting um it was still scary, you know? It still felt very unreal, sort of about what I was saying before, like, this is this is actually my life now? How is, how is this, how could this be? Um, uh, and, you know, the rhythm of the, of our year usually is such that from right around Thanksgiving, a little before Thanksgiving, past the new year, um, things both by choice and because people don't want us sort of in their homes disrupting their lives, like work quiets way down, the carpentry work. Um, and sometimes the winter lasts longer, you know, than that. And, um, you know, um, sort of having to, I mean, it's a hustle. So it's kind of like, all right, now I've got to make some money with writing and um, sort of filling, filling, filling in the sort of financial gaps that way. Um, so it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge. Um, but again, like feeling so lucky to have, have the two in combination. Um, and Mary is also someone, my boss Mary is also someone who's extremely, um, wonderful about, you know, if I say like, all right, I'm not, I, you know, I've got to do an interview. I'll be there at like 1030 this morning instead of eight, you know, totally fine. You know, it's like, she's very accommodating in that way. Um, I think in part to make up for the fact that like there will be months without work and sort of keeping that, those relationships going. Um, that was a long answer to your, oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so wow, much. thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys very much.